Sorry, I couldn't swallow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I was to say, you Ash? <laughs> I'm trying to. I was trying to swallow like spit and it wouldn't go down. Actually, this goes back to the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Remember when we first met John McClain? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Hot Patootie Weiss. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie we take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV. We review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch where you play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing tonight? Uh, Gene, tonight's uh, episode is a very special one. As October rolls around and we enter the Shat Spooktacular. Now, traditionally, all our Spooktacular films have involved some kind of violence, murder, blood, uh, Serial killers, demons, poltergeists, uh, janitors burned alive in the basement of the school, coming back for revenge, lots of things like that. But we've never done one quite like today. So for our 2022 version of the Shattacular, we're going to a very special place with transvestites, rock and roll, audience participation. It is the cult film requested by one of our great listeners, Jeremy, and it can only be the 1975 The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Well, and our commissioner wrote in and said, hello, Shatters. The first time I saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show was in 1990 in New Orleans. I was 17 and I had to drive an hour to get there. And after seeing it, once I went back every weekend or so for a year. I joined the Air Force and every base I was stationed at, I would find and watch the Rocky Horror Picture Show every chance I could. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is more than a movie or a cult classic. It encouraged fans to dress up as the characters and act out scenes in front of the screen. It changed every time you saw it because someone would come up with a new joke to scream at the screen. It welcomed you into its strange little world, and if you accepted it, it accepted you. That is why it's important to the LGBTQA plus community or the goth community or the weirdo kid from rural Louisiana. It was a safe space for the outcasts to be themselves. That is why it's so important to so many. As a movie, it's not very good. Maybe a four white. The acting, directing, pretty much the everything sucked from an objective glance. The songs are pretty good with weird lyrics, but not a good movie. Factor in the audience participation and it's one and a half wipes. The wit and fun of a cast can only be experienced. It is one of those things you just have to see and feel to understand. The community around it is a zero wipe. From cosplaying before that was a thing to making it okay to not be the football loving jock or whatever other metric was used to define normal and just allowing you to be you. Definitely a zero wipe community. And that comes from Jeremy. So it definitely is spooky season here, Jeremy, because you flipped our world upside down. Normally, it's the commissioner saying this is a zero wipe movie or at worst, like a one wipe movie. You're like, no, I admit this is a four wipe. I will disagree with you on that jeremy i think it's much better than four wipes as a movie just on its own i, I think jeremy's just using some reverse psychology ah. traditionally people write in and then we go the opposite so he's thinking i'm gonna zig when they zag i'm gonna tell them it's a shitty movie and they will fall in love with it 
I don't know. I think that Jeremy's opinion is the opinion a lot of people even that love this film have. And I think it's really sad because I think it's like this almost like apology for what the Rocky Horror Picture Show is when really like what makes it so amazing and not a four white movie is how weird it is and how completely disjointed it feels in parts. So I think a lot of people make that excuse to make it like okay to like it. But this is a zero white community and like much better than a four white film. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is a 1975 musical comedy based on the 1973 musical stage production, The Rocky Horror Show. The film stars Richard O'Brien, Tim Curry, Susan Sarandon, and Barry Bostwick, and is narrated by Charles Gray with cast members from the original Royal Court Theater, Roxy Theater, and Belasco Theater Productions, including Nell Campbell and Patricia Quinn. The story centers around a young, engaged couple whose car breaks down in the rain near the castle of Dr. Frank N. Furter, who actually is an alien transvestite from the planet Transsexual in the galaxy of Transylvania, who creates a living muscle man named Rocky in his laboratory. Initial reception was extremely negative, and the film was withdrawn from its eight opening cities due to very small audiences. Its planned New York City opening on Halloween night was canceled, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show appeared to be a flop until midnight showings began. Still in limited release in 2022, it is the longest-running theatrical release in film history, most often shown close to Halloween. So, Ash, Big D, we always ask where you were and what your memories are of the film we're reviewing tonight for the Halloween Spooktacular. It is the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and Ash... Please do the honors. I am so excited about tonight. I had messaged you guys that I rarely get nervous when I have to do notes. There's been a couple of films here or there, and this is one of them because I love this movie. I remember moment by moment, the first time that I saw Rocky Horror, I remember being totally enamored with each like frame that was on the screen. And then came college. So I saw it in New Orleans off of Britannia Street when I was in high school. And then in college, there was a huge group of us from Tulane that would go all the time. I mean, someone went every single week. I didn't go every week, but I went really often. And we would dress up, we would sing every song, and it was just awesome. You know, we get drunk, we took up with people we met there afterwards. And it was just like this glorious like moment in time. And it was this amazing community that I had not really found because I was a total like outcast for a while in high school and found a couple of people here and there that were like me. But like I found my community in college as most people do. And part of that community was defined by these viewings. And like to this day, so many of my memories from like 18 to 22 are so wrapped up in Rocky Horror. And the music, the dialogue, I feel like I've seen them a thousand times. Like I can quote it. But This is one of those movies that even having seen it so much, it never gets old. I was a fairly isolated suburban nerd until 1994. I finally got my own computer at age 14, and I discovered online bulletin board systems. And if you guys out there don't know what these are, before we had access to the main internet, before we had AOL, there were these BBSs, and you would call them up with your computer using the phone-based modem, right? 1200 baud connect and you could only have like one or two users on at a time because this was a server literally in someone's home. But we would get on there one by one. You had to keep calling back throughout the day until you could get connected and do your business on the bulletin board system that day. And in the forums on those bulletin board systems, I learned that there was this Phoenix goth community. And where did they meet up? It was every Friday around 10 p.m. outside the Valley Art Theater on Mill Avenue. And they got together to watch something called the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I had no idea what it was. But this goth girl, Sylvia, who went by Jeton (laughs) on the bulletin board systems, she invited me by not inviting me. And if you're not a goth, you might not understand this, but it's a thing. So I show up. I'm in a Hawaiian shirt. I got a buzz cut and like knee length jorts. I'm a football playing ROTC kid. Everyone else there is so mysterious, so devious, so sexual, so exciting and I felt both awakened. Like, <laughs> what is this world? And I'm a part of there's something in me that needs that is a part of this that I never knew. And at the same time, so out of place. I'd never been to something like a seedy old theater that smelled like spilled sodas and popcorn and beer. I've never seen people drink from flasks in a theater. I've never smelled anyone smoking cloves. 
I'd never heard anybody yell during a movie in a theater. I didn't understand the movie at all. I had no fucking idea what was going on, but I was along for the ride and I loved every second. Man, you must have been the, the, the hot little item that number. You were the different kid. I wonder how many people want to convert you. Mm, look at him. Yeah, the 205-pound, 14-year-old Persian kid with the buzz cut and the jorts. Oh, but you're different. That's, that's what's attractive, you know, when people are not quite where you used to. Ash, can I get a ruling on this one? Yeah, I don't think anybody was at all <laughs> oh, interested come on. in him that night. Come on. I mean, like, like, once he truly converted, yes, like, absolutely. But that night, I'm like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> 60 okay. pounds later. Okay. Well, I think on this review, you, you two guys are obviously – Big fans of the film. You love it. I'm coming in, I think, as the everyman. I had not seen it before this commission came in. And I'm not surprised that this thing did not do well when it came out. The 70s people were not a very tolerant time. Okay, Not that we're the great now, but we're much better. If you look at that poster and you see Tim Curry in drag, he's sitting on the pair of lips, he's got leggings on. I can't imagine how they marketed this film that people would want to come to see it. it very, very different, but I'm very glad that Jeremy intervened in my life. And Gene, in passing, one day mentioned when we were talking about schedule, he said, Hey, on the 18th, I'm going to be going to the Shadowcast live, you know, version of Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I just casually said, Hey, I'll join you. And I'm sure Gene thought you're full of shit. You're not going to join me. But I decided to, for Jeremy, the podcast, for our audience, to board a plane, a couple planes, fly 5,000 miles to see Gene and Sarah for 24 hours total. I landed in Phoenix at noon. I was gone the next day at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And that was all to experience the Rocky Hour Picture Show in its glory, the way that I have been told you have to watch it. And I'm very glad for this podcast and for Jeremy for adding this one little nugget into my life that I'm certain I never would have done. I also want to extend an apology to Big D's knees because this man flew on multiple flights. I'm guessing coach probably yes. then got to Phoenix and I put him in the tiniest seat. The, the celebrity theater in Phoenix was built in the sixties and there is literally the distance from hip to like your entire femur that you're allowed. There might be 20 inches. This man had one leg over the seat in front of him, one leg in the aisle. And that's after flying all day long, kudos to Big D's knees. I'm very glad that you and Sarah put me up and we got a lot of good tacos. We got some fish. We had some beer at some cool places. But for people who you've never done it, because I think a lot of our audience may not have seen this, even though it's a cult classic, you get props. So Gene got me a prop bag. So this will be our first film about a movie with a shadow cast that has audience participation. So right now I have my birthday cap, which will come in later. I've got my playing cards. I've got my party noisemaker. And for when it rains with Janet, I've got my newspaper. So I'm ready, Gene. Let's take us to that trailer. You've seen all kinds of movies, but you've never seen anything like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror Picture Show is wonderfully weird. I'm your new commander. You now are my prisoner. They're probably foreigners with ways different than our own. It's fabulously freaky. It's a trip to transsexual Transylvania. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. The story is strange. But tonight is the night that my beautiful creature is destined to be born! The songs are super. The scenery is smashing. The cast is completely crazy. This isn't the Junior Chamber of Commerce, Brad. There's a mad scientist named Frank N. Furter. Come up to the lab and see what's on the slab. And Rocky 
his incredible creature. I knew he was in with a bad crowd, but it was worse than I imagined. A sinister servant named Riff Raff. And Brad and Janet. My name's Brad Majors. Just a couple of clean-cut kids. This is my fiance, Janet Weiss. Touch it, touch it, touch it, touch me. I wanna be dirty. Eddie. Magenta. When shall we return to Transylvania, huh? Columbia. Dr. Scott. Great Scott! So give yourself over to absolute pleasure. See the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But you've never seen anything like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Let's do the time warp again. Let's do the time warp again. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is wonderfully weird. The film starts with the opening credits for the main cast before a criminologist narrates the tale of the newly engaged Brad Majors and Janet Weiss, who find themselves lost and with a flat tire on a cold and rainy late night In November 1974, seeking a telephone, the couple walks to a nearby castle where they discover an ongoing annual Transylvanian convention. There they meet the Igor-like riffraff, his French-made sister Magenta, and a groupie named Columbia. Dr. Frankenfurter introduces himself to the couple. Maybe I'm just a sap, but I get really emotional whenever I hear Rocky Horror Picture Show's opening song, Science Fiction, Double Feature. As the movie opens up, if you haven't seen it, there's this black screen. You see these trademark red lips that are on all the posters and all the merch. And then Richard O'Brien's like tiny little voice shows up. There's this swell of music. And already in the theater, I'm about to cry every time. Big D was to my left. Sarah was to my right. They were seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show in a theater for the first time. And I heard them singing along and it just felt so... (laughs) good to know you're feeling what the other people around you are feeling for this dumb musical from 1975 that's talking about science fiction stars from the 1930s and the 1950s. I love that this movie has a full overture, like a real one, because so many movies, especially movie musicals, like they don't take the time to do this, to set the scene for what's to come. And if the musical did have an overture, a lot of times they cut it or they just like play it randomly in the background. But Rocky Horror Picture Show, it takes the moment to set the stage. And those strange parts of that song, you know, that everybody clings to, like the way that he sings Brad and Janet, like, you know, the way they're said, like, for me, this movie, when this like kicks up, like, it feels like coming home, which I know sounds really strange. But like, I cannot overestimate and over explain how much this is like related. You called it an awakening. Sure, we'll go with that. Like the awakening at this time of my life of like finding people who got me and me figuring out like who I was. And that's what this movie is for a lot of people. So this community and when it opens, that's why I think we get so emotional. It's not the song itself. It's just like that remembering like this is when it clicked. It clicked that we belong someplace other than just like the normies that are everywhere. I think I'm going to say this a lot. This film, it's in my head and I can't figure out. I should not be liking it, but I find myself actively engaged with it. Normally I have to fight to not hate things like this, but the songs, they're catchy. They get in your head, but not in a bad way. It's not the I'm too sexy or the Macarena that gets in your head and you can't get it out. These songs are so good because, like you both said, they put the time into the production. Their quality 
And they're not on the nose for the scene. A lot of times you have to listen to the lyrics, try to figure out the tie in what's going on. And they, they happen at points in the movie that you don't expect them to. And for that, I've really found myself enjoying it. I think you just doomed the rest of the podcast because I'm going to have the Macarena stuck in my fucking head yeah. for Me the rest too. of this recording. Dun, Thank dun, you dun, so dun, much. Dun, it's dun, there dun, right dun, now. Dun. It's in there. <sighs> well, I will take your point for sure. I think that the music and this is part of what makes this movie so special. But let's just talk about the elephant in the room, if it were, which is the time warp. That is the song that everybody remembers from this like it's the song that randomly plays at weddings or retirement parties and like people who've never seen rocky horror they know this song and somehow have learned the dance that goes with it and and look here's the deal time warp it's fun it's a great song the costumes are fun like i get why it became you know the thing that people play but it's nowhere near the best song from this movie. There are so many others that are better, um, including the finale song, which we'll get to very soon. But I just want justice for those other songs. Like people should be singing all the others, not just this one. Yeah, but you know what? It's got a good hook. It's like the Monster Mash. It's one of those songs that you can play out of context. You can't play Damn It, Janet. Yes, you can. Mm. No, I don't know if you could play it out. Once you've watched Rocky Horror, yes, damn it, Janet can go and you really like it. Or the the Pooty, the Pooty Booty song or whatever the hell that thing is. Hot Patootie. Yeah, Hot yeah, Patootie. Not that a Pooty Booty. <laughs> okay, you can play those. But this song, even though it's the most memorable, you should be happy that is because this wasn't even in the stage musical. O'Brien added it because that was only 40 minutes long. He needed something to take up the space. So when Gene and I are in the audience with Sarah, they ask all the virgins, basically, they're going to shame us to stand up. And we have to identify ourselves in the audience. And as a virgin, I totally expected this song was going to be like at the end. This was going to be the big crescendo. We're going to get the group at the end. There's going to be something going on with a time warp. But it wasn't. And I was happy it wasn't because as a virgin, that song comes on and it's a gateway to the rest of the movie. I felt comfortable. I said, OK, this is going to be something wacky. And without that, if it was at the end, I don't think I would have been strung along as well as I was. I'm so glad that Ash said it because I thought I was alone on this. Uh, time Warp's not that good. I swoon over science fiction double feature. I giggle at Damn It, Janet. I get pumped for over at the Frankenstein place. And I listen to every second of the six minute long Rose Tint My World, which people think is like three different songs. It's all one big ass beautiful song. But the Time Warp, for me, it's like a take it or leave it song. Same goes with Superheroes, the song that they sing like after the castle takes off, spoiler alert. They, they just don't really do it for me. And what blows my mind is if you listen to the soundtrack at the end of the soundtrack, like on the Spotify version of it, there's like a remix of Time Warp. I'm like, we didn't need it once, much less twice. You could just leave this one off the soundtrack entirely. Well, and I think the problem is that Brad and Janet are great as characters. So like the songs that they sing on their own are really fun. And then you get introduced to Dr. Frankenfurter. And once Tim Curry comes into this movie, like there is no way to like anything that doesn't involve him because there is something about this man in this role that is just iconic. Iconic. And every time he comes out of that elevator, like I just like lose it inside. I posted on my Instagram story when I was watching this. I watched this a couple weeks ago for the pod because this would have happened anyway. I watch it at the start of October every year. Like it's one of two Halloween films I watch every single year, the other one being The Shining. And just like every other year, when Tim Curry struts that runway of people to the other side of the room where he is stepping every step to the beat of that song singing don't get strung out by the way i look and that whole interlude 
I don't care if I'm alone in my living room or if I'm in a theater full of people like you guys were. Like, I sing, I dance along because he's fucking iconic. There are so few characters today that are this original. And that's the thing that I think we forget is like we joke all the time nowadays that like nothing's new, right? Like everything is like reinvented of something else. This was completely new. This character is unlike any other character that ever existed before he came into existence. And the music takes a big turn here because prior to this, it either falls into like the plinky plinky 50s rock and rolly kind of feel or like a doo y kind of feel or an operatic kind of feel. But this is like electric guitar, like and Tim Curry shows up. He's really a movie within a movie. Like as soon as Dr. Frank is there, it's his movie. The camera lives for him. He controls it. The audience lives for him. And Tim Curry is like this five foot seven weakling in women's underwear, but he's so powerful and so maniacal and so sexy. Mm. And when we think of Mm -hmm. outstanding performances, you think of like Tom Hanks or Leonardo DiCaprio or Denzel Washington, right? These big dramatic roles that people talk about. How did he pull that off? And oh my God, did you see that movie? But Tim Curry's ability to take that stage presence from the live Rocky Horror Show and convert it to not just film, but also soundtrack. It's the stuff of legend. He is a huge, powerful being in this tiny little frame. Yeah, I think without him, the film does not work. And he channels that like hair, like that hair band 80s rock with the outfit. He owns it and he walks on. And I, his outfit, you know, the, the, the women's underwear, the, the pantyhose, the whole thing. I don't notice anything except for his voice and his teeth and what he's saying. It's almost like the outfit that you think you couldn't get over. It's just background to him just slaying it on screen. That's an excellent point because for most people, you'd be, oh my gosh, what was he wearing? Did you see that? If it was anybody else. What no, the Tim fuck Curry, is like, he wearing? Yeah, it's an afterthought. <laughs> I was afraid of him. Well, it's like it's like he couldn't be wearing anything else. Right. Yes. That is clearly what he would wear. And that's what's <laughs> so powerful about this character is in like two seconds, you have this whole new experience of like a person or a thing or this being that. I mean, you mentioned he's sexy. He's sexy as fuck. Like his lipstick, like everything about him is just like pure energy. He's amazing. I would say he looks dangerous. Not sexy. Dangerous. Mm -mm. I think he looks enticing. Big D channeling his inner Brad Majors over there. (laughs) In his lab, Frank brings to life his creation, Rocky, whom he can transform into an ideal man in a week. Delivery boy Eddie, whose brain Frank had used in the creation of Rocky, breaks out of a deep freeze riding a motorcycle and gets the Transylvanians dancing and singing. When Rocky starts dancing and enjoying the performance, a jealous Frank kills Eddie with a pickaxe. Brad and Janet are shown to separate bedrooms where each is visited and seduced by Frank. Janet wanders off to find Brad, whom she sees smoking a cigarette in bed with Frank on a video monitor. She then discovers Rocky hiding from Riff Raff and Magenta and decides to become intimate with Rocky as Magenta and Columbia watch from their bedroom monitor. Let's talk about Susan Sarandon. I love everything about her performance in this movie, but her interactions with Rocky have always been my favorite. When she's with Rocky, she's just so funny because like her little sexy, innocent walk and her little movements, like they're just so perfect. And I cannot imagine her not being this role. Um, Apparently, she was really nervous about taking the, the role itself because she said she couldn't sing. But she's like the essence of Janet through and through. And for me in Shadowcast, I I prefer just like the audience participation events, like the sing-alongs more than I do the Shadowcast. But I've been to many Shadowcasts and the ones that I've been to. I have the most issue with whoever is playing her because whoever's playing Janet, I usually like just dismiss because I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the ones I've been to, they get these super hot girls so that they can see them in like their underwear or they get someone the total opposite of what Janet looks like. Right. Yeah. We know not at ours. It's one or the other. Like it's either like 
like in my experience and like she isn't super sexy like she is hot but she isn't like busty and then she's also not what some of the other people that are cast as her look like and so there's no way to replace her just like there's no way to replace tim curry and i just want to give a big shout out to like laverne cox i i obviously thought it was an abomination that they made a live on like abc or wherever the fuck that was rocky horror but if anybody else could play frankenfurter i mean laverne cox was not a bad choice and she looked hot but she's just not tim curry when Barry Bostwick brought up the new release of it, the booze Ooh, like shook yeah. the room. People yeah. are very pissed about that. And they should be. Yeah, it was, they should be. But it's just, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's doomed from the start because no one is Susan Sarandon and nobody is Tim Curry. I was surprisingly attracted to her. I thought she was, uh, we've questioned her her beauty in later films. And I, I think I equated her once to a young Sigourney Weaver. Now, no way. Susan Sarandon, young. She is something special to behold. And you said she was reluctant, Ash. How could you not be reluctant? If my agent came to me and said, hey, I want you to read this script. Uh, can you go watch this stage performance? Any agent would make you run away. Run away fast. Get out of here. This will kill your career. This would be the death. Susan Sarandon won an Academy Award. I would say that was a 0% chance of that happening because this could have gone a very different way. There were other actors up there. Did you know, Gene, that Steve Martin was up for playing Brad, but they actually picked Barry Bostwick over him? I think Steve Martin would make an excellent Brad. I agree Mm -mm. with you, but he may have stolen too many of the scenes where Brad has to be a bit of a tool and take a step back. This was something brave to take. And another one, I'm going to say a lot of things on this podcast I never thought I would say before, but I enjoyed Meatloaf. I I enjoyed him. He's only in the film for a short time. We get Eddie. He comes out. I have questions. I don't know why, but at this point, I've stopped asking why. From what I get, Frankenfooter kidnapped him. He seems attracted to him. I don't know if they hooked up. He was dating Columbia at the time. She's heartbroken. He's in some deep freeze. So he's been hibernating, whether, you know, Frankenfurter wants to keep him for sexual exploits later. And that song comes on, Hot Patootie. And I'm thinking this is going to be grease. I got the greasers on the motorcycle driving around. But no, Meatloaf, he does a saxophone romp and he's a reanimated biker. And I could, I was questioning who I was. I'm questioning who you are. Big D, you must have been incredibly turned on by this whole thing because you keep injecting like a maybe they were fucking. Maybe they were fucking. I think <laughs> I think Eddie was just being used for his brain. I think they just needed half a brain and then keep him around for the other half a brain. So further experiments, yes. Sexual experiments, I mm-hmm. don't know. But as a kid, I, I never liked Hot Patootie. I thought that song sucked. It was just like a filler song with some fat guy riding around on a motorcycle. That's I'd always kind of in the theater, stop paying attention for about five minutes until it's end. But it has grown on me over the years. Uh, Brad is billed in the opening credits as a hero of this movie. But Eddie is the real hero here, if there is one. He sweeps Columbia off her feet. He like charms all the party guests. And he has so much pure rock star confidence. If you look at Meatloaf on stage during this film, he could be the greatest rock star in the world. And you're not concerned with the fact that he's a very big man with a scar on his head on a fucking motorcycle. Yeah. And I mean, Eddie gives us like one of the most important parts of this movie, which is, you know, Frankenfurter, he kind of plays in the gray as to whether or not he's a bad guy here and there. But like when we see what he does to Eddie, like it's clear, like the dude is dangerous, right? Like he's menacing and there's nothing better than that scene where he comes out of that deep freezer and there's blood everywhere. And he's got that, you know, latex like scrubs on with his pearls and it is so perfect. And in the moment you realize that this is not, you know, a comedy musical, that this is actually a horror film and this is why people watch it at, you know, Halloween. Yeah. Big D got your blood right there. Mm -hmm. I told you it's scary. 
But he still looks pretty hot. Well, and let's talk about the brilliance that like is magenta and riffraff because we haven't mentioned them yet. And once you've seen this like a thousand times, I would suggest Big D the next time you watch it to only watch the backgrounds of the scenes because they go back and forth in these backgrounds from the opening scene at the church where Tim Curry and the two of them are flanking him all the way throughout where they're just stalking and like and lurking in the background of all of these scenes. And they're like the utter heart of this movie their looks that they give their body language they are so fabulous they are so incredibly funny and even just the way like magenta sounds a gong just the way like her body is positioned and the way she plays that comedy the this movie is half the movie that it wound up being without the two of them yeah richard o'brien is so absurdly talented uh he co-wrote the movie he started in it he sang in it riff raff somehow makes being a ghoulish hunchback also kind of hot. Magenta is every goth girl I crushed on in the 90s. And I just love seeing the two of them throughout the movie, especially when they transform into those spacesuits and they just look incredible after having been shit on the entire movie. That transformation is fantastic. And again, Richard O'Brien from Rocky Horror Picture Show to Dark City, just a man of many faces. That's pretty much the same face. Well, Frank returns to the lab with Brad and Riff Raff, where Frank learns that an intruder has entered the building. Dr. Everett Scott, Janet and Brad's former science teacher, now investigates UFOs for the government, which alarms Frank. Dr. Scott explains that he is there in search of his nephew, Eddie. Frank, Dr. Scott, Brad, and Riff Raff then discover Janet and Rocky together, angering Frank and Brad. At this point, Magenta sounds the gong to summon everyone to dinner. So when I posted on Instagram and Facebook that Big D was in town to see Rocky Horror Picture Show for our spooktacular, tons of people commented, as they do, with advice. Uh, you know, you have to take him to the midnight show with the shadow cast and props for the full experience. Don't let him just watch the movie as if he would have flown out here to just you know watch it at my house. That was our intention the entire time, guys. And we had the honor of seeing the movie hosted by Mr. Barry Bostwick, who plays Brad Majors in the film. And it was shadow cast by Frankie's Fishnets, which is a local Phoenix Rocky Horror Picture Show cast. And they did a fine job. They were good. But I got to say that the movie itself is really worth watching on its own. Like Ash said, I think the audience participation is the best way to do it. Shadow cast is a different way to do it, but not as good. Because Meatloaf, Susan Sarandon, Richard O'Brien, Patty Quinn, Little Nell, they're all working their asses off the whole movie. And they deserve to be seen. The shadow cast and the props almost felt like a distraction this time around. Like people were looking at that. They're looking at the guy with the five foot inflatable dick shoving it in everybody's mouths on the screen. And they weren't actually watching everything that was happening on screen, which is very entertaining in itself. See, but I think at this point, the two are intertwined. You can't separate the movie and the live portion of it with the, the cult following. Because what I found fascinating was Gene and I were, were, were people watching in the crowd. And you had the old gray haired and then you had down to the 15 year old a cross section of the arizona phoenix community that i was proud you could tell this is gonna live on and before i went out there i you know gene loves to prep i like to be prepared i had watched the film even though without it it was a bit of a schlog to get through at first but once you get the song down once you get the idea of what's going on then you go see the, the live stage performance that's how you create a fan because it's the community, the ridiculousness of it. I think if you just watch the film once on your own, I don't know you'll get into it the way that you could. I've definitely had fun at Shadowcast before. Those are fine. But a, a lot of other times, probably the majority of the time, like I said, I prefer to just see the film. Um, but, you know, Har Rocky Horror, the biggest mistake that they made, I think, when they released it is that this was meant to be seen with people, no matter the way you go about it. It's like such a communal experience. And it's so much fun when you're sitting there and everybody knows the callbacks and everybody knows what to say and everybody knows those songs and i'm really glad big d that you got to experience it both as a film and as an experience because i also think 
it's great as a standalone film because I don't go see Rocky Horror at, you know, the the movie theater anymore. I just watch it at my house, but I watch it at my house like with people or like there's parts that I'll allow Fenn to come in and he'll watch it. And like he thinks some of the songs are really amazing. He thinks Dr. Frankenfurter is like the coolest thing ever. Um, so, you know, it's meant to be a communal like shared experience. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever do it again. I don't know. Gene, now that you said that it wasn't necessarily the best shadow cast, I'm thinking maybe there is a, a better one that I would want to say. What I'm saying is the three flavors, right? There's watching it at home by yourself, watching it in a theater with audience participation, and then watching it in a theater with the shadow cast. Oh. I'm more of like a class two person, right? Where we're still yelling at the screen, we're still throwing the props, okay. we're doing all this shit, but there isn't a cast oh. of people acting it out in front of us. I feel like they're they're a, distra- a distraction, but welcome at times, right? So it's like, it's like Ash said, it just depends on your mood. If I had to choose a way to do it, and there was only one way that I was allowed to do it, it would be with audience participation, no shadow cast. That's my recommendation to, to listeners out there who haven't seen it before. Yes, totally. That's what I would do. And you got I would definitely want to do that. And part of the whole experience, I was wondering, I was like, how the hell did this all start? And we got to be honest, as much as you guys love the movie, as much as it's a cult classic, this movie should have been dead. This movie should have been buried to the history of film other than the first movie that Susan Sarandon did or like the, one of the first movies in Tim Curry's career. It should have been buried, but it did not. It kept the, it was, this was like the corpse. This was Eddie who rises up out of the table and continues to live on. So I was like, I have to figure out how this happened. So going back, Brian Thompson, he was the production designer. He said he first witnessed a phenomenon in New York's Weaver Theater in 77. And this was the theater that was the first in the country that played Rocky Horror Picture Show as an exclusive ongoing midnight only movie every week. So what happened was he went in there and he heard the people screaming, getting at the yelling out, interacting, having props. And he said, what the hell is going on? And the people in the audience said, well, we thought the movie was kind of boring and we would yell back and have more fun. Without this interaction, the film does not live on to today. And it's part of the joy. Today, when people do things like the gentle minion phenomenon, right, where people show up and they're all dressed, you know, in their finest to go see the minions movie. That is on TikTok. That's on Instagram. That's on Twitter. That's on Reddit. People are are sharing it out and it's getting, you know, global distribution of this message or this concept. And so other people are following the trend. What I love about this is this was the seventies and they didn't have any of that. There wasn't a, a, you know, internet to go to much less like a, a, a national advertisement that said, go see this movie dressed up like this. It, <laughs> it started organically mm-hmm. because they thought the movie was boring. Like that's it. Yeah, people out there, there used to be, you couldn't find movie times, so you had to call up a phone, movie phone, and listen to every theater read through. There was no, this is the true grassroots movement. One person tells another person tells another, but it got me thinking, Gene and Ash, if audience participation could save this film, what other film do you think could benefit from this type of watching? The one that immediately comes to mind is The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, right? It's got all the hallmarks of a perfect audience participation film. It's got shitty effects. It's got wacky characters. It's got music. It's got really odd lines. Like people say just the most bizarre shit in that movie that you could do the call and response to. Very distinct costumes that make it easy to dress up as the Hong Kong Cavaliers. There's a lot going on there. Or you could dress up like the Lectoids, either black or red. Like everything really works for Buckaroo Banzai to be an audience participation movie. And I would love to see that. I would love to see that make a resurgence as a rockier picture show type deal. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That was certainly one that came to mind. I mean, the other one that I participated in is I've been to a bunch of the Buffy you know, audience participations for Once More with Feeling, that episode, which are super fun, just as much fun, honestly, as Rocky Horror. But movies, yeah, I mean, I think Buckaroo Banzai is the obvious choice. 
Rocky and the guests share an uncomfortable dinner, which they soon realize has been prepared from Eddie's remains. Janet runs screaming into Rocky's arms, provoking Frank to chase her through the halls. Janet, Brad, Dr. Scott, Rocky, and Columbia all meet in Frank's lab, where Frank captures them with the Medusa transducer, transforming them into nude statues. After dressing them in cabaret costumes, Frank unfreezes them, and they perform a live cabaret floor show, complete with an RKO tower and a swimming pool, with Frank as the leader. So there are so many iconic dinner party scenes in movie history. There's, you know, Christmas Vacation, you've got The Ref. I mean, there's just so many, too many to list. And most of them involve like cutting a turkey or like carving up a pot roast, like something like that. And I'm sorry, but this one is definitely at the top of my list of best dinner scenes ever. Because the way that they cut that meat and then it's just tossed (laughs) on a plate, no sides at all, and that they're still in their underwear, his little apron. It's moments like this that Rocky Horror Picture Show, it feels more like a play almost than a movie, which is why I think the audience participation works so well with it. Like you almost have to have something that feels more like a musical or a play for it to work in that way. And then you also get another little Nell scream when they realize what, you know, the dinner is. And those are my absolute favorite. So. And this is one of the audience participation moments that makes me laugh every single time. When they bring up Eddie and Dr. Frank says, that's a tender subject. Would anyone like another (laughs) slice? And the camera goes to Brad and the audience yells out, Brad gets it. And then it goes to Janet. Janet gets it. Dr. Scott gets it. Rocky doesn't care. I'm watching the movie and I could be convinced that everyone in the cast Mm. knew that these words were going to be shouted at the screen 47 years later because it plays together so perfectly. Sometimes those audience participation moments are forced, but this is so organic. It's so good. And that entire dinner scene is just epic. But another thing I learned, Gene, that those reactions were real. The cast was not expecting him to be under the table. So when they pulled it off, that was genuine shock. But I find myself right now internally conflicted. I pride myself, other than the rare times when when Roger Roper was on the podcast, where I know I anger wiped some films. Something you know, I, I, I let it affect me. I've admitted that before. Quite. Yes, I, I think Spaceballs is better. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is better. But I was I was rage wiping. So I that's possible, and I try to be as fair as I can be. And this movie has so many things I should hate. Musical check. Bizarre story check shitty production quality check but i'm still hanging in there and i'm wondering why in my brain it's illogical i'm feeling guilty i know you both love it i had a great shadow cast experience it was a great day with gene and sarah and i'm wondering if my judgment is being impartial or i've been swayed by my experience and not just the movie Now, there might be something to that, because when we watched Cable Guy with Roger after going to Medieval Times, it also got one of our greatest (laughs) wipe scores ever. So it might be that when we get together, we just get high on each other um, and do that. Like if you, Ash, and I got together and watched a movie, we would completely blow up the wipe score and be in like negative wipes or something. So we're all going to gather together and watch Blade Runner. There you go. That's the deal. And then I'll get two wipes. But- This is an exceptional musical, Big D, not just a musical. Nearly every song is an absolute banger. They're absurdly catchy. Unlike shit musicals, I'm looking at you, Hamilton. The story, yes, it is bizarre, like you said, but it's simple. A couple gets a flat. They check into a spooky castle. They get seduced. There's a murder. And then the servants rebel against their master. That's the gist of it. Everything else is just kind of window dressing. And as for production quality... It's overcome with a ridiculously good cast. People forget that this is a movie that has Susan Sarandon, Tim Curry, Richard O'Brien, and Patty Quinn in a campy 70s musical, right? That that has to give you something. And we've seen it time and time again that if you've got a great cast, production quality is really secondary. And I don't know. I think Rocky Horror is a weird, a weird entry into the shot pantheon because of the fact that it is so 
impossible to disconnect it with the audience experience now. Like that is what it's become. I think that you're you're right on by letting those things like persuade you to think that it's better than it is because that's why those things exist in the first place is because it made it, you know, be what it was an intended originally to be. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that, you know, unrage wiping. What's the opposite of rage wiping? poop ignoring like you know you wipe and you could tell you probably have to wipe one more time but you just let it go is it just like tossing someone's salad no like a wet wipe yeah maybe yeah, it does more work right so like maybe i don't know i think i think it's okay i think here's the test we need to do blue velvet as an audience audience participation uh see but this is like if we were doing like a food challenge right rocky or a picture show let's say that's a hot dog right it needs a bun and it needs mustard that's just, those are necessities. And so if I gave you just a hot dog by itself, I'm like, what do you think? It's okay. It's not bad. You put bun and mustard on it. Now it's delicious. That's the way it's yeah. meant to be eaten. Blue velvet was not meant to be eaten with a bun and mustard. It was meant to be a bunch of bugs underground. <laughs> but they represent something. And it's amazing. Have I showed you my chicken? Is that an ear? That's interesting. <laughs> Riff Raff and Magenta interrupt the performance to inform Frank that he has failed their mission. Riff Raff declares himself commander and Frank attempts to explain himself, but Riff Raff kills both him and Columbia using a pitchfork shaped ray gun. An enraged Rocky gathers Frank's corpse in his arms, climbs to the top of the tower and plunges to his death in the pool below. Riff Raff and Magenta state they will be returning to their home planet Transsexual in the galaxy of Transylvania warning Brad, Janet, and Dr. Scott to leave immediately before the castle lifts off into space. So I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to eventually get to the last song because this is by far my favorite part of this movie. Uh, Gene, you get choked up when the black screen opens and they start singing the opening of this movie. For me, I lose it every time they get in the pool and they begin singing Don't Dream It, Be It like literally every single time I get choked up. And I am not somebody who gets choked up easily. I am not somebody who cries in movies, but there is something about it that I just find so like beautiful and wonderful and strange. And like the way like their makeup, like sort of like melts off of them and they like fold into one another and they just like kind of start becoming this amalgam and this one being it's amazing. And then you top that off with Tim Curry's big number with all of his makeup finally washing away and he's showing like his true self and just this desire for people to love and respect him. And then that rejection and then him getting killed in the end. Like it's such a tragic ending. And it's funny because he mentions, you know, Fay Ray. And then all of a sudden he's got this King Kong moment. Like, you know, there's, there's some humor there. But the beauty of this like ending part, it's so fucking intense jeremy mentioned how much this movie means to the lgbtq plus community and i know dr frank has taken a lot of criticism for being a problematic character uh, particularly with reinforcing and hyperbolically expressing trans stereotypes in general but i don't think that was the intent of the character or the film uh, this is one of the most heartbreaking and inspirational refrains from a song we've ever heard in a film or otherwise. And like you said, Ash, everyone kind of meshing together in that pool, despite their differing backgrounds and their evil deeds that they did throughout the movie and their personal histories. Everyone's just in the pool, giving themselves over to absolute pleasure, not giving a fuck about looking a mess. Mm -hmm. And they're just melting into the screen. And it reminded me of what like the best drugs do to me. I felt that when we watched it together. I feel that every time I watch this movie, it's something special. I don't know if either of you ever watched Sense8, the television show done by the Wachowski siblings, but it's an amazing series if you've never watched it. But there is this orgy scene that they have in one of the seasons where all of the Sense8s, they all like have this massive orgy together. And it's such a beautifully shot scene where like you can't tell where like one body ends and another one begins and like gender means another nothing and like you know sexuality means nothing and it's just like bodies on bodies on bodies and it has to be a direct like 
a direct reference to this movie because that's what it is. And think about when this came out. Like this movie was so revolutionary yeah. and so ballsy to even shoot a lot of the stuff that they did. This scene being the biggest of it because, you know, those corsets are not on right. You can see their nipples, you know, it, girls included. And like, you know, it just, it's such a, I don't know. Y'all said like it's a strangely sexy movie. Like this is not a strangely sexy movie to me. Like this is an overtly sexy movie and it culminates here and it's, it's kind of beautiful. This movie must've been like a lighthouse around the time to people who felt different to the LGBTQ community who maybe you lived in a small town and you'd never met anybody else because everything was, was hidden. People weren't coming out to see this. And to go see it in a theater, probably with like-minded people, giving people hope or making people feel like they're part of a community when the people around them didn't make them feel that way. So for that, this film must have been that, that ray of hope for people watching it in the 70s. I make fun of people who think Tyler Durden is cool or Don Draper is cool. Like when they watch Mad Men or Fight Club, like you, you get that you're not supposed to be this guy, right? You get that this guy is a disaster, right? And sometimes I wonder as I'm watching this movie and I'm kind of cheering on Dr. Frank and I love him in this scene and everybody's surrounding him and I'm just like, oh, Dr. Frank. I love the character. I love Tim Curry playing the character. Like he is the best thing about the movie and I'm saddened when he thinks he's going home, right? And then he just gets killed. You can't say he didn't deserve it. Like he's whipping his teammates. He murders Eddie because Rocky thought he was entertaining. He rapes Brad. He rapes Janet. He serves Dr. Scott, his own nephew, for dinner. Like this is a bad, bad transsexual. And I don't know if I if we're missing the point on this movie by finding him endearing. The point here is that he's an anti-hero. I don't think he's ever pitched as like what you're supposed to go off and want to be. Nobody should want to be Dr. Frankenfurter, but you can't help but, you know, find some fun in his demise, but yet it still be a gut punch. And I think that is a testament to the embodiment that Tim Curry has in this character, because I think the gut punch is not that this bad guy is dead. It's that the movie's done. Like, I think that's why we feel it because when Frankenfurter dies, the movie's over because there's no movie without him. Right. And if he were a good guy, none of it would be as memorable. We wouldn't get the Rocky moment. We wouldn't get him mourning him. And I think that, again, without Tim Curry, who the fuck else plays this? Like, there's no one because even just his voice, the way that he sounds, the way that he sings. I mean, he's so I mean, he approaches this like it's a Broadway, like he's not approaching it like it's some like silly sci fi movie. He throws everything into it. And Frank is not a good guy, but hell, if I don't like to see him die every single time. Before killing Columbia and Frank and Rocky, Riff Raff comes in with that pitchfork laser and he says, your mission is a failure. Your lifestyle is too extreme. And I can't believe this question didn't pop into my head until I was sitting there in a tiny chair sandwiched between Big D and Sarah with a belly full of fish and chips and barley wine. And I'm like, what the fuck was their mission? I've been singing those words for nearly 30 years, and I never thought about it. What mission was a failure? What are they supposed to be doing there? I I was coming to you guys for that. I don't know. The only thing I could come up with was the Medusa transducer, that like testing it out on humans was the mission, but they even accomplished that. I mean, I've always viewed it like it's a play on like Frankenstein, right? That like he's supposed to make not a monster, but like. You know, he's supposed to make a, a something and, and he's not. But he did that. Right. But he's not able to make it in just seven days. I'll make you a man. But he couldn't because he got a little sidetrack having sex with the people who had car trouble and wanted to have sex with his creation. I don't know. In death, I would just like to say, Dr. Frank, honorable mission complete. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. <laughs> oh god now is the time in the podcast where we give our chat score for the rocky or picture show our chat scores are our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get our respective butts zero wipes is a perfect movie is being born a beautiful muscle man and having sex with a young susan sarandon before you're even seven hours old and five wipes is an absolute disaster of a film and is asking for nothing and receiving it in abundance ash we'll start with you what is your wipe score for the rocky or picture show 
I mean, I think it's pretty clear that I love this movie. I think it's the best. I think it's funny. I think it's weird. I think it's dark. Um, and it's all the things that people that I love it love and are. Um, so many of us, myself included, found Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, and it was at a time that was so formative in our lives. And as a result of it, we found a community. We found a family. We found ourselves in a lot of ways. And I know there may be some eye rolls out there, but like that's really what it felt like. I think that more than anything, we found like who we could be. Um, who we were like allowed to be and that there were people that would be around us that supported it. So, you know, my mom would stop putting me on the prayer list at church because of the way I dressed and people would just like take me to buy like actual clothes and not the knockoffs that I had been purchasing. Right. Um, And so beyond that, though, beyond like my own personal experience, I just think it's a funny, badass musical, catchy as fuck songs, incredible acting. One of the best performances of any that we've reviewed, which is Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenfurter. Um, is it perfect? No, of course not. It's not a perfect film. Um, I'll, I'll say this. Our commissioner, Jeremy, talked about how it's a zero white community. Absolutely a zero white community. And I think it's a one white film. So I'm stuck here because we are reviewing the film. You can't separate it from the experience from what it becomes, but I'm going to try to. I think that the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It is fun. It is strange. The cast is exceptional. The performances are great. The songs are catchy. But without the other half, Gene, without the the ketchup and the bun, this is just a two wipe hot dog. So I'm going to give it two wipes, better than average. But again, with the entire community, with the the shadow cast, that's probably a half wipe. So two wipes for this hot dog. All right, this two wipes from Big D, one wipe from Ash. I'm going to split the difference here. I love this movie. It is so personally important. And I've been singing the songs and listening to the soundtrack nonstop for weeks. I picked Big D up from the airport. It was on. He's been gone a few days. It's still on. It's an inextricable part of my sexuality, my identity, and my lust for nightlife. Like, I was born into the night. Part of that was this movie. The performances are incredible, But it's just an entirely different animal in a vacuum, as you both alluded to. If you just sat me down and you put on this movie with no frame of reference, no audience, no culture around it, I'd still think it's a good movie, but it's not a great movie on its own. Uh, There are moments like when Rocky is running from Riff Raff to the Rocky Horror Picture Show version of Yakety Sax, where this looks like incredibly 70s low budget and poorly acted with like the sped up film. It's not good. And I don't know if it's because I'm always watching it late at night, but I'll admit that I always have this like yawn of shame right before the floor show that I managed to like hide in my cape so nobody can see it. But it does happen. It it feels like when it gets dim toward the end, I'm almost ready for nap time sometimes. And so I got to give it one and a half wipes right in the middle. So it's one and a half wipes from me, two wipes from Big D, one wipe from Ash gives us an average wipe score of 1.5 wipes for the Rocky Road Picture Show. So, Gene, with a score of 1.5 wipes, I know ties this. I mean, with, with a bunch of films at the 92 spot, The Thing, Scrooged, Spaceballs, Friday the 13th, Galaxy Quest, UHF, Scarface, Magnolia, Stand By Me, The Naked Gun, and Three O'Clock High. Ash, how does that feel tying it with your own commission? I mean, Magnolia is such a different fucking film than this <laughs> Magnolia one, right? is great. Um, not one that we want to go see in a community theater filled with others. Um, but yeah, I mean, it feels all right. A lot of those films feel really nice centered around this one. I'm just glad that you didn't give it a five white big D. I was really worried that you might not really like it. If you go into this with an open mind, I don't think you could come away hating it. Ash, I should be a shat lobbyist because I picked him up. I took him to his five-star hotel. <laughs> I took him out for pizza and beers, watched the Yankees game with him. I got him more beer. Then I took him to the finest seafood in Phoenix. And then we went to the theater. So really, that's the way to do it. You need to fly here to Houston. I will do all those things for you here. And then we'll watch Grease 2. Wow. And we will re-review it. Oof. And I'll uh, shadow cast. <laughs> yeah, <it's really laughs> no, that would be so good. Cool. I have to say, I'm really disappointed in our review in one way. I'm going to give us a 2.5 wipe because we did not sing at all while reviewing Rocky Horror, which is like very weird. I did an impersonation. You sang. And I had a party horn. 
I sang? I don't remember singing. So it was musical. Oh, I said Brad and Janet. There you go. But like that isn't, you know, I mean, we should have sang some more. I felt like the the woman behind me, every time that Janet would do something that I thought was kind of bitchy, even though it wasn't part of the show, I would be like, whore. I would yell whore. And the woman behind me seemed to take offense the amount of times I was calling Janet a whore. Well, it's because you were supposed to be yelling slut. Oh, shit. Was I yelling whore or was I yelling slut? <laughs> no, you were yelling slut. You oh, okay, good. Wow. Now you got me. <laughs> I was like, shit, was I that there's guy? 200 oh. people in the theater all yelling like, slut, and then there's just this one giant whore. Like, whore. I was calling Brad a dick. Yeah, no, I was not that guy. <laughs> Big D really pissed off the Trumper that was sitting directly behind him. Oh, my God. But, Gene, before I get to next week's film, I do want to give a shout out. If you're ever in Phoenix and you're near the airport, please go see our good friend Liz at the Sure Stay Hotel by Best Western. It looks like you're going to lose your life there. But you won't. The rooms have been recently redone. Uh, We like the tastefully done decor. Uh, It easily can fit three people eating fish and chips out of styrofoam containers uh, after they've been drinking at a brewery. It is a nice place. You can find an affordable room. And tell Liz that Chat the Movie sent you. Sure stay by Best Western. Nothing but the best. Five U. (laughs) Like I said to Gene, who renamed this place? Was it like, God, should we stay at this place? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Let's just stay there. Let's stay there. Hello. (laughs) Yes. So, Gene, next week, college student Jeffrey Beaumont returns home after his father's had a stroke. Thank you, Description, for telling me that. When he discovers the severed ear in the abandoned field, Beaumont teams up with the detective's daughter, Sandy, to solve the mystery. They believe beautiful lounge singer, again, Dorothy Valens, may be connected with the case. And Beaumont finds himself becoming drawn into a dark and twisted world where he encounters sexually depraved psychopath Frank Booth, commissioned by Kenneth C. Came out in 86, and whoo, we've already watched and recorded this one. Well, thank you, Kenneth C., for commissioning our upcoming film. And thank you, Jeremy, for commissioning our Shat Halloween Spooktacular for 2022. Happy Halloween, everybody. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. Email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, chatpod.com slash TV, where everywhere a fine podcast can be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Happy birthday, Sarah, and be sure to join us next week for the following movie. From the mind of David Lynch comes a modern-day masterpiece. So startling, so provocative, so mysterious, that it will open your eyes to a world you have never seen before. Hey, neighbor. Here I come. You got about one second to live, but- but I find myself right now, <clears throat> sorry, choking. Yes. Mm-hmm.